Hebrews chapter 11, verses 15 to 28. Hebrews 11, 15 to 28. <clears throat> this change has been made very clear since a different priest, who is like Melchizedek, has appeared. Jesus became a priest, not by meeting the physical requirements of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed, out, pointed this out when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yes, the old requirements about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath, but there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath, and you will not break this vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this, bow, this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. You, There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need. He is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the, the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once and for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. Heavenly Father, as we look at this, this passage, as we look at your word, as we look at the fact that, that we have a high priest that lasts forever, I pray, Lord God, thousands of years of separation between us and this, this system. But yet, there's absolutely no separation between us and this system because we are a beneficiary of this new system. I pray, Lord God, you open our eyes and help us to realize what's being said here and the significance of Jesus being that high priest sitting on that throne, interceding on our behalf. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you and we praise you, God. I pray, God, you help us to understand the whole system and how this whole thing worked and how it's working now. Oh, Jesus, in your precious name, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's over 50 chapters in the Bible dedicated to this very subject. 13 of them in, in, Je in um, Exodus, 18 in Leviticus, 13 in Numbers, 2 in Deuteronomy, 4 in the chapter of in the book of Hebrews. 50 chapters of the Bible are dedicated to this one subject. The tabernacle. In 2008, I did a six-part series on the tabernacle, looking at every single part. It felt like it went on forever at the time. But it's one of those fascinating subjects that I, I just, every time I come across it, every time I come up on one of those 50 chapters, I just it's just so fascinating talking about this tabernacle, this building, this tent that was in the wilderness, talking about the parts, the, the, the brazen altar, the candlestick holder, the, the incense burner, the, the, the ark, all of these things. It's just so fascinating. I, I stumbled across Indiana Jones and I started thinking about the tabernacle in the wilderness. It is such an interesting subject. I'm not going to take it in eight parts. We'll cut it down to one. But... This, this, this building is just so incredible. Mickey and I were sitting here talking. We was getting the music organized this morning. And I, I, I pulled up this quote because this quote just hit me when I came across it. It says, a university professor, and I, I don't know who said it. I just came across it. A university professor was teaching a survey class in the Bible. 
or on the Bible. She held, a, held it up and said, this is the account of man's search for God. But that is alter, utterly false. It's accurately the account of God's search for man. This is what the tabernacle is all about. This is what makes Christianity different than any other belief system on earth. All other religions are about man looking for God. But God is actually looking for man for the purpose of saving him and dwelling within him. Over and over again, you see that God reached out to the Israelites. God reached out to them, helped them, protected them. You see that God sent Jesus. We see that God reached out to them in the garden. We see that God reached out to, to different families here and there. He's, he's constantly reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. He sent Jesus. He sent people. He sends dreams. He sends in visions. He speaks to us. He's always reaching out to us. How many people came to know Jesus because they were looking for him nine times out of ten. People come to know Jesus because God sent somebody to them to tell them about the Lord. Because God sent them. Because he was calling to us. Christianity, are the God that we serve, he's reaching out to us. He loves us so much and he just wants to have fellowship and a relationship with us. 500 years, this was the place that God dwelled on earth. This was the place that people went to to communicate. Through the tabernacle, it gave God a way for sinful man to be able to approach him. Or it gave man, a sinful man, a way to approach God. Either way you look at it, there was a way to be able to communicate, and he opened a door or he put a curtain in there but he had a curtain that they could go behind once a year he gave a place for them to be able to go he had the pal pillar of fire by day and the or pillar of fire by day and the smoke by night a place that they knew they could go and find their savior and talk to him Exodus 25 verses 1 to 9 the Lord said to Moses tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacrifice the sacred offerings accept the contributions from all whose hearts are moved to offer them here is the list of the sacred offerings you may bring for him gold silver bronze pur blue purple and scarlet thread fine linen and goat hair for cloth tanned ram skins and fine goat skin leather Acadia road olive oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and fragrant incense, onyx stones, and the gemstones to be set in the ephod of the chests, the priest's chest place, chest piece. Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I show you. He says to Moses, have them build this so that I can dwell among them. He wanted to dwell among them. The entire thing was the lengths that God went to to be able to be reunited with people. People look at the, 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 the event of creation. It takes up three chapters in the Bible. I've spent... So many hours studying creation, studying the, 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 the flood, studying all of these things. And yet it's only the first three chapters is talking about creation. Up to six is talking about the flood. But here we got 50 chapters of the Bible where we seem to bounce over the tabernacle and the temple so quickly. And, and I kind of see them both as sort of the same thing the tabernacle and the temple, because they both had the same idea, same purpose, same room, same, um, same furnishings. People often look at creation, and look at the trees, and look at the plants, and look at the stuff like that, and think, that's just God trying to draw our attention to him. Yes, it's one of the ways. But the way he tries to draw his attention to us is through our heart, through Jesus trying to get a hold of us and saying, hey, I'm here, I care about you, I love you. His reaching out to us is through his love, through his love, through his, his, his attempts to just get our attention. It's where he dwelled in those days. It's an incredible picture of, of, of who he is. It's an object lesson of his love. 
It's a lesson. It's a, it's a, it's a view of, of who he is in his presence dwelling among us. The tabernacle, Jerry, um, Jerry S., he says, the tabernacle was moved over 30 times. The glory cloud of God's presence would hover over the tabernacle, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But then the cloud would rise and would begin to move. Their job was to quickly tear down the tabernacle. 8,500 people were responsible to move this thing, specifically assigned to tasks to move this thing when it had to be moved. Then they would re-erect it again and the cloud would hover over top of it. How neat is that? 30 times. I was thinking about that thing in over 400 years, 30 times, but then I realized, no, it was 40 years in the desert. 40 years they spent traveling, and then before they finally actually got themselves to where the, the temple was built, 40, 30 times, 30 times they moved this thing. So just over once every year, once every maybe 15 months they moved this thing. 8,500 people were responsible to move this thing. It's not that big. That's a lot of hands on deck. But when you start looking at it, in Numbers chapter 2, it tells you how they were supposed to set up their camp. You had this little tiny tent in the middle of this camp. And then you had the tribes put into place. The Levite tribe was put in the middle, closest to the tabernacle. And then you had the different tribes moving out from there. Judah, I'm not going to name them all. They're all going out from there. And the neat thing is, the tabernacle was in the center. And as you went out from there, you ended up with this thing that looks like a cross. And they had to be done in a certain way, in a certain formation, in just the right way. And way back at the time that Israel has just left Egypt, suddenly you had the people of Israel forming the cross with God in the center every time they would set this thing up. I often look at these kind of things, and of course my brain, you know, you guys know how it works. Where did they go to the bathroom? Because they would have been so compacted into there. Where did they get their food? That's why they would have had to move, because they would have used up all the natural resources in the area, and then they would have moved. All the firewood. Where would you go to get firewood when you're living all so close together in such a small place? Every year they would move. Every year they'd end up in a new location. Could you imagine being a neighboring town and having that move in right outside of town? All those people, over a million people suddenly show up. Every part of that was pointing at Jesus and it all pointed into the middle because the sacrifice happened in the middle of the tabernacle, in the middle of the cross, in the middle of the presence of everything. And all of a sudden, you'd have this cloud sitting in the middle that every tent they could look and see, there's the, there's the pillar, there's the fire, there's the, fu there's the smoke. And they could always keep an eye on the presence of God being in the center of the camp at all times. They're finally out of really Egypt. They're finally in a relationship with God. And the Lord is pursuing them. And he shows them, this is how you approach me. This is how you reach out to me. Hi, I'm Kay Warren. I'd like to walk you through my favorite portion of scripture found in Exodus, the tabernacle in the wilderness. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God led the Israelites to freedom. Shortly after, God invited Moses to spend time with him on Mount Sinai. On the mountain, God gave Moses two systems for his people. First, he gave a system of law. God gave detailed instructions for moral, ceremonial, and spiritual laws, the most well-known being the Ten Commandments. God knew the Israelites would break his laws, so at the same time, he gave a system of sacrifice that would allow the sins of the people to be covered and make it possible for them to be in a relationship with him. God's next instruction to Moses was to house the system of law and the system of sacrifice in a sacred, set-apart place called a tabernacle 
where God promised to live among his people. The tabernacle was built right in the heart of the Israelite camp at the base of Mount Sinai. While the pagan nations around them had gods of wood, stone, and clay, Israel had a personal God who wanted to be a part of their daily lives. The first thing you would see as you approached the tabernacle was a sparkling white linen fence. The fence was high enough that no one could climb over it and firm enough at the bottom that no one could crawl under it. The only way into the tabernacle was through a brightly embroidered gate. The white fence said, stay away. But the gate said, come in, but come in this way. Jesus is like the fence, pure, holy, spotless, and he is the gate. He provides us the only way into a relationship with God. The tabernacle is divided into three parts, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. In the outer court, there were two articles used in worship a large bronze altar where animal sacrifices were offered, and a large bronze basin called a laver, where the priests washed their hands and feet before offering the sacrifices to God. At the bronze altar, an Israelite would bring a spotless animal to be sacrificed, but before it was killed, he would put his hands on the head of the animal and confess his sin. There were many prescribed rituals in how the animals were slaughtered and what was done with them afterwards, but the most important part was that an innocent animal gave its life for the sin of a person. Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. He was an innocent lamb who voluntarily gave up his life to make us right with a holy God. The next thing you would see is the bronze laver. Only the priests used the laver, and it was made from the mirrors of the women of Israel. There was nothing special about the water, but it served a practical purpose to clean their hands and feet. It also signified that they were sanctified, set apart for God's use. The labor illustrates to us how the Word of God cleanses us to be set apart for His service. The next thing you would see is the tabernacle building, which contained the holy place and the holy of holies. Only the priests were allowed in the holy place, and only the high priest was allowed in the holy of holies. As you enter the holy place, there was a very large, beautiful golden lampstand that was beaten out of one piece of gold. It provided the only light in the holy place. Jesus said in John 8:12, I am the light of the world. He provides the illumination to our minds so that we can get to know God. On the right, there was a small wooden table covered with gold. It held 12 loaves of bread that the priests ate on the Sabbath. The 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes of Israel who were different in number and strength, but on this table they were equal before God. Jesus said in John 6:48, I am the bread of life. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Jesus is the bread that sustains us. The golden altar of incense was a small altar that was used just for burning incense. The sweet smell filled the holy place with a fragrance that pleased God. When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would carry a burning coal of incense in with him. The altar is representative of prayer, and our prayers are to be offered to God at all times through Jesus Christ. The sweet smell of his fragrance is to permeate our lives. There was a thick embroidered veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was allowed to go behind this veil and into God's presence. At the moment Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple in Jerusalem was torn from the top to the bottom by God's hand, indicating there was no longer any barrier between God and man. In the Holy of Holies, there were two pieces of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. The Ark of the Covenant was a wooden box covered with gold that held the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. The ark was a place of safety in scripture, and this ark contained Israel's most valuable treasures. The mercy seat was a golden lid with two cherubim that fit on the top of the ark. The cherubim were symbols of God's judgment. The lid came between a holy God and the broken law contained in the ark. On the day of atonement, the high priest would sprinkle blood from a sacrificial lamb on the mercy seat, and then God's presence would fill the Holy of Holies indicating that all of the nation's sins would be covered for one more year. The Bible calls Jesus Christ our mercy seat. The Bible says because of his death on the cross, 
His blood was the once-for-all sacrifice that finally made salvation possible. God has mercy on us because of Jesus. No longer are our sins covered for a year at a time, but finally forgiven. There is no need for further sacrifices. The temporary purpose of the tabernacle was to establish God as the true God, unlike the gods of the pagan cultures around the Israelites. And the eternal purpose of the tabernacle was to point to Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation, not just a temporary sacrifice, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now every person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is reconciled to God. We become tabernacles, dwelling places for God, with all access to Him forever. All through the Old Testament, there was prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy of what Jesus was going to do. And this entire tabernacle was a prophecy. Every part of that tabernacle was pointing towards what Jesus was going to do and the roles in which he was going to do them. You had your different areas of this. You had this outer court area that all the Jews could come, regardless of the tribe they came from. All of them were able to approach this area. They would come through that gate. They weren't allowed to enter any other way, but through that front gate, they would come in. They would bring their sacrifices. They would bring their children, their families, and they would come in there, and they would meet the priests, and the priests would take their offering would put the offering to death, and then they would take the offering, and they would sprinkle it over the coals of the brazen altar. This was a place that anybody and everybody could approach, but that's as far as they could go. They could see the bigger tent further in. They could see the holy place ahead of them. They knew that the Holy of Holies was further in there, but they couldn't go. They couldn't get to that word that says entrance. They knew that the door was closed to them. You had to be born in the right family, and you had to be chosen within that family to have that job, and the only way you were ever going to get in there is to be born in the right place at the right time to the right people, and the door was closed any other possible way. A one in 12 chance to be able to be a part of that family. And then even lesser chance of ever get the world to work further in. But they were encouraged to approach God. Come as close as they could. Approach them. Bring their offerings. Worship them here. Come to this location. And they would come. And it wasn't that big. It was only 50 feet by 100 feet. But they would approach and they would come and they would give their offerings and they got their opportunity to approach their holy God. They spent 400 years sitting in Egypt. Now they finally got their opportunity and they get to come. They come and they worship They'd approach this brazen altar with these little horns on the sides that would point in different directions. And they would, they would come walking in and it had a certain, a certain way versus north and south. And it would sit in a certain direction and it would point out. And it pointed out towards all the tribes. So that when a sacrifice was made on this thing, the horns were pointing out saying, this sacrifice is for all of you. This represents the redemptive work that Christ did on the cross for us. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 25, it says that all of us have sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, and yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ. He was freed from the penalty for, he has freed us from the penalty from all sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin, People were made right with God when they believed that Jesus, Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. His sacrifice showed that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times of past. We should have been punished. We should be given. We have a death sentence on our, on our hands. But Jesus was willing to pay that death sentence. He went and shed his blood, and his blood was was sprinkled for us. His blood was shed for us. He became that ultimate sacrifice. No longer do the Jews, no longer do us, no longer do any of us ever have to be able to go to a brazen altar, bring in a sacrificial animal representing what God could do, and no longer do we need to do this and bring him before this, this priest 
I said a minute ago that you had to be, you had to be a from the family of Levi. The only one of us in this room that's even a descendant of a Jew, period, is Mike in this room. All of us wouldn't have been able to go. We would have never been able to be the high priest to be able to go into that Holy of Holies. None of us in this room could have possibly been able to get there. And you're not even a full-blood Jew, so you still wouldn't have been. You're defective. We wouldn't have been allowed in. But through Jesus' redemptive blood, or through his redemptive work, we have been given the opportunity to approach. The opportunity to come in. He represented the sacrifice. He shed his blood. He presented it once and for all. They had this basin thing outside where they could wash their hands and they would go in there and they would wash their hands and their feet and they would get themselves all taken care of and they had to wash in this thing before they could go into the holy place. After they'd done the sacrifices, you can just imagine how dirty this would have been. They're handling animals. Animals would have dropped presents as they brought them through. Animals, though the families would have cleaned before they got there, there still would have been dirty. It would have been a dirty place to be. It would have been a dirt floors. And, and these, 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 these animals were brought in there and the people were there and they had to wash their hands. They could not approach God with their dirty hands. Their dirty hands represented the sin. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, it says that we need to daily come and wash before the Lord. We need to daily come and, and present our sin, present our lives before our Lord. Daily coming and, rem- and remembering that what he has done for us. It's not that we need to ask for forgiveness every single day. That's not what it means. It means that we're daily remembering what he has done for us. The washing foreshadows what Jesus did. It remembers and shows us that we have been cleansed, we have been washed, we have been, we have been cleaned from the head to the toe. We have completely taken, it's been taken care of. And just as Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he says, your whole body is clean. We just need to take care of this. We don't need to wash the whole body. It's already clean. It's just a reminder of what he's done. It's just a daily reminder that he went to the cross. Just like when we have communion and we remember his sacrifice and that he's coming again, it's a reminder of what he has done. They would wash, and they had to wash before they went in because their lives could be on the line as they went through that entrance into this holy place. This room sitting on top of the same soil that would have been out in the other area. It's just... That's the place. That's the location. It was just this little room. It wasn't even very big. 10 foot by 20 foot by 10 foot. It's not much bigger than a shed. And they would enter into this room. And the sacrifices would have had to have been made before they went in. The priest would bring their sacrifice to the brazen altar. Then they would go and wash. And then they would go into this room and they would tend to the candlestick holder. They would tend to the table. They would tend to the incense. And not all f- priests were freely allowed to go in there. It would have been by casting of lots. It would have been by the job they were given. And they would go in there and they would go to this table You had 12 tribes parked around the outside of this tent. 12 tribes sitting out there, the one of Levi in the middle and the ones going out from there. 12 tribes. Each of the tribes would bring their loaf of bread. The bread representing that that, that, that they could be a part of this, 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 this holy place. This was the only thing that they had that ever went inside there. And they would present the best loaf. They would make all these loaves and they would choose the best of the best. And they would give their loaf and the loaf would be taken in. Jesus in John chapter 6 verse 47 to 57 it says that he is the bread of life. Anyone who eats of that bread will live. This was allowing the 12 tribes to have something of theirs go into the presence of God. Right into the holy place. Every Sabbath, a new one would be chosen. Every Sabbath, each tribe would send their representative with their best of their best, and they would present it to the priest, and the priest would then take it and put it into the pile. On the other side of the room, you had this 
candlestick holder representing creation. Your six days of creation. And it says that this thing could never, ever go out. It was never allowed to go out in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20 to 21. Do not ever let this thing go out. You had somebody, their entire job was to make sure the oil in that thing stayed full. Somebody's job was to make sure the wicks were constantly being trimmed so that thing would never go out. That was to always be running. And something is very, very interesting. Go to the very beginning of 1 Samuel when you get a moment. The very beginning of 1 Samuel. When you look at that, you'll see that God is talking to this little kid. And you see that it says... When God calls out to Samuel, there's a little line in there. It says, just before the, the candle would go out, or just before the light would go out each night. By the time Eli was the high priest, they let that thing go out at night. It's the beginning of 1 Samuel. I don't know what chapter it is. It's the beginning of 1 Samuel, and it says that they let the light go out each night. This was a law that was put into place in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20 to 21, to never let this light go out. Because the light represented the fire that was up above the building. But they started letting it go out. They were so messed up by the time Samuel came along that they, it was commonplace to let the thing go out. It represented the six days of creation, but the seventh day, the seventh day of rest represented the, all that God had done, all of his creation. It represented that Jesus is the light of the world. It represents that we are to be examples to those around us. It represents that the light that we see and the light that comes on inside our hearts, when God illuminates himself within us, we see him and he shines within us. And our light is never ever to be hidden. It's to never go out. When we're presenting Jesus, when we're even planning on it and not planning on it, when we're sitting there in traffic going through Toronto and, and everything's haywire. Susan, Danny and I went through Toronto yesterday and the snow was coming down so heavy you could barely see the car in front of us. We all had our four ways going. It was coming down so heavy and even in the peak of it all, we're supposed to be representing Christ. Even when everything's falling apart, we're supposed to be representing Christ. We are never to let our light turn, go out. We don't let it turn off in the evenings. There shouldn't be a point that each day we let it go out. And we'll just go ahead and get the bick out and relight it in the morning. That's not how it works. Always, always be letting your light shine. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And this, this is a law that has been placed in us. Let your light shine. Don't put it under a bushel. Don't let Satan whoosh, it out. And the incense altar, this little box, this little tiny box is only one foot by one foot by two feet tall, this little tiny box, about the size of the thing the computer is sitting on, this little tiny box. But it was full of incense, and the incense had to be made a special way, just the right way. It had to be made, and they had to bring the fire from the brazen altar, and they would reach in there with a pair of tongs, and they would choose a nice juicy coal, and they would carefully bring this coal in, and they would set it down into there, and they had the, the, um, they had the incense in there, and the incense had to be made exactly a certain way, a certain form. Everything had to be made, and it says that this system, this, this formula, this, this, this recipe for the incense was not to be used for any other purposes in Israel. They all had the recipe, but they were not to make that recipe and use it in their own their homes. And it had to be done exactly according to the way that God told them to do it. Why is that? Because the smoke from this incense, it says in, somewhere, in Psalm 41 verse, Psalm 141 verse 2, and Revelations chapter 5 verse 8, it actually says that the prayers of the people were carried on the smoke from the incense, um, incense altar. 
It was a physical representation of the prayers being carried into the throne room of God. And the smoke had to be a certain smoke exactly the way it wanted. Now, when we fast forward to the New Testament, we have this, we have this statement that Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Who carries our prayers to the Father today? It's Jesus. There's only one way that we approach God, and it's through Jesus. We cannot make up our own Jesus. We can't make up our own system. We can't change our system. We can't duplicate the system, and we can't use the system for any other purpose. The system is Jesus, and he carries our prayers to him. And the only way we're allowed to make, the only way we're allowed to preach, approach, the only way allowed to get to the Father is through Jesus. They put this curtain in there. It was a representation of a, of a division. This thing was thick. You could not look past it. They couldn't go around it. They couldn't lift it up. That thing was to keep the people away. Even the priests that were allowed to come and go, even the priests that were supposed to keep that candle going, they weren't allowed to go past that curtain. They saw the one side, but they weren't allowed to see the other. And God didn't like the curtain, but he was a holy God, and he still is a holy God, and he cannot look upon sin. He cannot look upon sin. He cannot, sinful people cannot approach his presence. And he wanted to dwell with them. He wanted to go camping with them, so he went camping with them. But he says, you cannot approach me, but I will be here. It was a separation between man and God while he was still living right in there with them. This room was 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet, a typical shed size with this little box, two and a half feet by one and a half feet by one and a half feet, sitting in the middle of this room. It wasn't very big. It was smaller than this table. This little table made out of gold with a cherubim on top, sitting in the middle of this room. And this curtain, this curtain, they say that it was as thick as a man's hand separated them. And I picture, what did it look like? Some people have pictures of cherubim on it. Some people have pictures of hearts on them and stars. And who knows? I don't know what was on it. But I can assure you that if there was a, like a, like a, like a, a cross-stitch thing where the one side looks really good and the other side looks like a mess, I can assure you if there was a good side and a bad side, they put the good side in for, G, for God. But if it's as thick as a man's hand, I'm sure they can have two good sides on this thing. And as thick as a man's hand. It says that it would have taken teams of oxen a week to tear this thing open. And it happened in the matter of in an instant. From the top to the bottom. God did the tearing, ripped it open, and all of a sudden, there's the Ark of the Covenant. All of a sudden, the holy place could see straight into the Holy of Holies. That was at the time of the temple straight into that room and all of a sudden it meant one of two things either God had left the building or we were allowed to come in once a year once a year a high priest could enter this room once a year they were allowed to go around this ta- this curtain I think it would be way too heavy to have lifted so they would have to push it to the side and squeeze on through carrying their, their stuff that they would have taken in with them, carrying the, the, the blood sacrifice with them, carrying the stuff, they would have got themselves in there. And they had to enter only according to the way that they were allowed to. They had very strict rules. They had to make sure they sacrificed properly at the brazen altar. They had to make sure that they washed properly at the, at the, at the wash station. They had to make sure that their hearts were right as they approached this room. And the people of Israel sat in their places waiting, waiting to hear, did the priest come back out? 
The neat thing is, is they had this outfit. It says in Exodus 28, verse 33 to 35, that they had these little things hanging off of them. I don't know what the pomegranates represented, but there was a bell pomegranate, bell pomegranate, bell pomegranate, all the way around the fringe of this outfit, because then they could hear the priest moving. They could hear the dingling of the priest moving around, and they knew that he was still alive, but they had a rope on his ankle that went all the way through the holy place into the Holy of Holies from outside. So that if, when you're fishing, and you can tell there's a fish on the other end of the line, they would check to make sure that the priest had been in there too long to make sure he's still alive. Because if he wasn't washed properly, if he hadn't sacrificed properly, if the sin wasn't taken care of properly, and he went in there, then it says that he would have died in the presence of God. And then, just like hauling in a fish, they would grab a hold of the rope and they haul his dead body out because nobody could go in for a year. And the priest's outfit would have been inside with him. They'd pull his body out. And every time the priest came back out alive, that meant that the sacrifice that Israel had made, because they had these two goats, one we called the scapegoat, and one of them was the sacrificial goat. They would take the scapegoat, and they would transfer the sin onto the two of them. One would get to leave out of town and live, and then one of them went in and was sacrificed. As long as that sacrifice, sorry, as long as they returned, because he would have had that blood from that sacrifice with him, he would have gone in, and he would have taken that blood, and he would have sprinkled it onto the mercy seat, looking for God's mercy, when he sprinkled that blood, him coming back out alive represented that the sacrifice had been accepted. If he didn't come out alive, that means the sacrifice was rejected and Israel lived in that sin for one more year. So then they had two years worth to deal with the next time because they couldn't do it again. The mercy seat was sitting between these bird-like things cherubim, angels. And somebody made this thing. It was just, it was a man-made box. Somebody made this thing and they built this thing and they, they would take the blood and they would sprinkle it on the lid of this thing. I often think, uh, I love the movie Indiana Jones, but I often think that thing wouldn't have been that clean. If they'd found it, if they really found the real Ark of the Covenant when, when, when Indiana Jones and the, the other guy lifted it out of that rock box, when they lifted it out, it would have been completely covered in blood. Because who would have cleaned it? It doesn't say that they cleaned last year's blood off before they put this year's blood on. So who cleaned this thing? So it would have been last year's and the next year's and the next year's and the next year's. Hundreds of years where the blood should have been on the lid of this thing. All dried on there. But I can assure you, it's clean right now. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perf perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands. And it was not part of this created world, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured redemption forever. Revelations eleven nineteen. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the Ark of the Covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. Lots of debate. Is this Ark of the Covenant the one that was made? Well, it wouldn't be the one made by, by Moses because I think they say that that one got destroyed at some point. But was this a human-made Ark of the Covenant or was this a God-made Ark of the Covenant? I have no idea. But I can assure you, there's one sitting in heaven in the throne room. You and I, as long as you're a believer and you have asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and you get to go to heaven... You and I are going to go in there and we're going to see this thing sitting there. The reality is Jesus is going to be a lot more interesting than the Ark of the Covenant. But it's going to be there. And there will be blood on that lid. But I can assure you, I, I'm pretty sure anyways, I'm almost 
99.9% sure every drop of blood that was from a sacrificial animal up until that day, if it's the one from earth, every one of every bit of that is long gone. And every drop of blood that you will see on there will be from the veins of Jesus. And he will have sprinkled it on that blood mercy seat. How neat is that? When the veil was opened, it was opened permanently. And it meant we could approach the Father. It meant one, A, one, he has left the building. And two, we can go in. Regardless of the tribe of Levite, regardless of being chosen as priest that year, regardless of whether you're even a descendant, a blood born descendant of Abraham or an adopted descendant of Abraham because we are a part of the family of God. Hebrews, 20, Hebrews 7 verse 23 to 27, he is the high priest. Jesus is the high priest. He will hold that position forever. His death did not end his reign as high priest. It actually began it. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is there. He is set up. He is not moving from that spot. And he intercedes on our behalf. He is carrying the praises and the prayers of the people to the Father. He is holy and he is blameless without sin. And he has been given the right to be the high priest forever. Jesus' sacrifice tells us two things. One, Sorry, Jesus' sacrifice was accepted. We know that it's, accept, it's been accepted because two things happened. One, the veil in the room was torn open, which means access was allowed to the Father. It also means that ark was obsolete and that mercy seat was no longer needed. I'm going to say it's a different ark because there should have been one in that room and Jesus delivered oil or delivered his blood to an ark in heaven. I'm going to say it's a different one sitting in heaven. I could be wrong. I don't know. It doesn't matter. And number two, the sacrifice was accepted because he walked out alive. They didn't need to haul him out from the rope. He walked out alive. He carried our sin in and carried, walked back out without it. How neat is that? In that day, in the tabernacle and temple days, only certain people, once a year, were allowed to enter. You and I, we can go any day at any time, in any location, just like the woman at the well that says, do I, need to go to the do I need to go to our mountain or do I need to go to the temple in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, the day is coming. You can worship in spirit and in truth. You will not need to go there. You will not need to go here. You will be able to worship in your own house, in your own car, in your own wherever you are in your prayer closet. You can approach God there. The day is coming. We live in the era now that the day has come. We are welcome. A priest could live a lifetime and never have gotten to go in there. But we can approach according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly, not in fear, we can boldly, can you imagine the heart pounding in that priest as he was walking through the first curtain into the holy place carrying, his, carrying this blood of an animal as they walk along thinking, did I wash my hands right? I had to do a COVID test on, Friday, on Monday. Oh my goodness, what an inconvenience that would have been if I'd failed this thing. I was feeling fine. I was we were going to visit Madeline's mom, and they made us do a COVID test, and I'm thinking, I'm feeling fine, but thinking, what an inconvenience and nuisance that would be if I failed this thing. And we're sitting there for 15 minutes thinking, am I feeling well? Am I not feeling well? I'm thinking I'm feeling well. It just goes through your mind the whole time, and of course we pass. But anyways, 
This priest would have been going through the same thing. Did I wash my hands right? Did I wash my feet right? Did I put this outfit on right? Did I, did I sacrifice right? As they go along and they get to that, that, that big thick curtain and they got to push the curtain to the side and they're like, what if the lots were wrong? And they go in. You and I, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of his death for us. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's people, let us go right into the presence of God with true hearts, fully trusting him. For our evil conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed pure with water. We've been through the wash station. We've been past the brazen altar. We can see our prayers being carried into the presence of our Lord, of our Father. We are now part of the 12 tribes. The light of Jesus is shining within us and we can walk right up to him. It's a big deal that Jesus died on that cross. It is a big deal. And the incredible thing is, most believers take it for granted. We take it for granted. Was us taking his death and resurrection for granted? Is it... Is, is that why Jesus went to the cross so that we can, we can fall asleep, so we can sit back and reel and think, oh, whatever, I heard it before, been there, done that? For centuries, for millennium, they wanted the opportunity to approach the Holy God and they weren't allowed to. Now we are allowed to and we take it for granted. Mickey was playing that song, the one down by the river, and as he was playing, he says, look at those days, look at the days that have gone past of hundreds of people down by the river wanting to be baptized, and hundreds of people wanting to be in the presence of God, hundreds of people wanting to spend time with our Heavenly Father, hundreds of people wanting to worship Him. What has happened? What has happened to our society? Where is this world going? Where is this world going? What happened? We've come to the point that we've gotten used to the opportunity to be able to go boldly into the presence and the holiness of our God. We've gotten used to it. And then what happens is an unbeliever comes along and takes a look and sees everybody half asleep or bickering or fighting on the inside. And they look at that and they say, this is what I want. They say, there's nothing to see here. Move along. We need to realize so that they can realize that we have the opportunity to reach the holy of holies. I was driving along yesterday in a vehicle that wasn't mine with no way of being able to play my own music, and I had that radio on scan. It was forever going through channel to channel to channel and channel. What a bunch of stations you can get down in southern Ontario. My goodness, on and on and on and on and on. It played and played and played and played and played and played and played. And, played. and there was nothing Christian that came up. And then finally it stopped on a staticky little channel that it was awful. There was this this this. If you like a banjo, great. It was somebody playing a banjo, very, very off-key, singing some old hymn. And I was just like, wow. I'm going to go back to the old 80s rock. It was just so, and I was thinking, this is the song they chose to play. Oh, it was just, and I was thinking, this is the only one for all of Southern Ontario. There isn't enough people in all of Southern, we at least get the one out of, out of Watertown and the one out of Belleville, and the one out of Ottawa. We get the choice of three, uh, Mars Hill, four, we can get to choose from as a Christian radio station sitting here. And down there, there was one. That was staticky. Is there really not enough believers to be able to have a group come together and fund a tower to be stuck up in the, on the hill? Is there not enough? 
No sin and no seeking. It says that few will find the way. It says that, that broad is the road to hell, but narrow is the road to righteousness. Are there really that few of people? Driving along and I was thinking, how many people, there's hundreds and hundreds of cars around me as I'm driving along. I'm thinking, how many of these people, if there's a pile up right now and we all died, how many of these people would spend eternity with our Lord? Where's our society right now? Where is it going? We have the opportunity to enter into, boldly enter into the holy presence of God today. We all look forward to Madeline's dad just passed away on, I don't know, last week. And he just passed away and he was ushered into the uninterrupted presence of God. He's seen which Ark of the Covenant is going to be. He has walked into the presence of God. I can't imagine he spent very long on his feet. He probably on his face crawled up to the presence of God. And there is Jesus. And Jesus is saying, well done, Bill, my good and faithful servant. Come on in. Let's go. And he wasn't interested in any family members that went on ahead. He wasn't interested in any of the other things. He wasn't interested in any crowns. He was interested in getting to see his Jesus. Because he loved his Lord so much. How many of the people in that group as we're driving over, we went over that Skyway Bridge and Danny's little tiny car, I'm telling you, it almost ended up like a paper airplane being thrown off that bridge. I mean, we've been to Burlington, there's this huge bill, and that, that car just went, And how many people would be in the presence of God if that happened today? We have the opportunity to enter into his presence today, right now. At this moment, sometimes we skip over the Old Testament. I kidded around a few weeks ago. You know, a new believer gets saved, and they read Genesis. They're like, wow, this is so exciting. Then Exodus, it's, you know, it's talking about what's going on. Then all of a sudden, you end up in Leviticus, and it feels like you're walking through water up to your neck, and you're trying to push your way through it. You always encourage a new believer, go to the book of John, start at Matthew, work your way through the New Testament, and then go back to the Old Testament. But Leviticus is so important because Leviticus points us to this building and the building points us to Jesus. Everything about the tabernacle is pointing at Calvary. Everything that happened there, even that priest walking out alive is representing Jesus walking out alive from that tomb. Jesus went into that holy tabernacle with the sin offering. He delivered the blood of life, poured it on their mercy seat, and walked out alive. Which means his sacrifice, not just for Israel, but for all mankind, going both directions through history, was accepted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Mm. Heavenly Father, we pray, God, for this person that Bonnie just got a text from. We pray, Jesus, you put your hand on this situation. We pray, God, for the paramedics that are in that ambulance right now that are on their way to whichever hospital they're going to. We pray, Jesus, that you will just pour yourself out upon that situation. We thank you, God, that they reached out to Bonnie. They reached out for prayer. And I pray, Jesus, that you will touch that 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 child. We pray, Jesus, whatever it is, you know what it is. Whatever's going on, you know what's going on. We pray, Jesus, you be with those doctors in that, that, that hospital that they arrive at. We pray, Jesus, you give them wisdom on how to handle this situation and what to do. We pray, God, for those paramedics. We pray, Jesus, you put give them wisdom and help them, Lord God, and just, just step into this situation, Lord. And we pray, God, that you will just be with this co-worker of Bonnie's. We pray, God, you'll give them peace right now, Lord God. Overshadow them in their vehicle. Keep them safe as they drive behind that ambulance, Lord. Keep them safe. Give them peace and calm, Lord God. And I pray, Jesus, again, whatever it is, we don't know, but you do. You see the whole situation unfolding right now. Jesus, step into that and touch that family, Lord God, and may they turn their eyes to you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, God. 
We praise you and we lift you up on high. Jesus, be all glory unto you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, God. And we thank you, God, that we can come boldly into the presence of the Holy God. We can boldly come into the holy place and we can stand before that you hear us and we know that you will carry them into the ear of the Father who is sitting right beside you. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We praise you and we come before you. We give it all to you, Jesus. We pray the same for Galen's mom and for Marie, Lord God, and for Madeline's family, Jesus, and for Margaret over there and Barry. Jesus, touch these people, Lord. Touch their bodies. Touch their hearts. Touch the peace, Lord Jesus. Your holy and precious and glorious, majestic and powerful name. And I pray, God, that we don't take it for granted that we can come into your presence. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.